First of all, I think when people hear policing uh, information, they think about fact checking. That's, I think, actually is a slippery slope, which is surprising because you'll say, well, fact. <laughs> the visiting professor of finance at Wharton. I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me here. One of your areas of expertise is, is on fake news in particular and, and, and how that can uh, affect um, news and financial news more generally. But I wanted to ask you to sort of go back a few years and talk a little bit about how we used to digest all types of news and uh, compare that to how we digest news today. I mean, from my own experience, back in, in the 90s or so, there was like six or seven newspapers that you would just read. And to that extent, um, you know, those newspapers had their degree of policing, like there was some uh, things that they couldn't say. And nowadays you have so many platforms where everyone can kind of say what they want. So how's that kind of affected the way that we used to um, sort of, you know, take in news versus how we how we take it in today? People have always sort of taken away from news what they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. We know people have confirmation bias. So even if we read the same article, but we have very different opinions, we're going to most likely take away, we're gonna hear what we wanna hear. But obviously that has gotten a lot worse because as you mentioned, we used to have a couple news channels, a couple newspapers. And even if the, I mean, policing was definitely more feasible at least, but also at least we started with the same you know, even if they weren't in silly fact, but they were the same ideas. Mm -hmm. And then we had a conversation about it and we might have had different opinions. Whereas now we start with completely different ideas because we know that people, even though we have in theory more choice now, mm -hmm. and often economists think more choice is better, but we also have the choice to listen to only what we want to hear. Not only do we read an article and take away what we want to hear, but we're literally reading exactly what we want to hear. And so we end up in these bubbles, and I think that makes conversation a lot harder. And obviously we know it's led to more polarization in the political sphere, probably also in financial sphere. And there's also definitely, and that's gonna where my research comes in, there's a lot of information that's being propagated that might not be exactly correct. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people are, and, and that happens in financial market, it happens in product markets. And I think people have trouble sort of differentiating that and understanding um, what's going on. And I think that sort of makes things even worse. So b before we get onto the sort of fake news aspect of <clears throat> the way we digest news today, just going back to um, we, being, we reading really what we want to read now and the algorithms playing a large part in that. Now, if the algorithms are doing their job, then you're constantly being sent things that you already sort of agree with which sort of almost by definition means the type of people reading those things are not arguing against it. So are we just naturally just gonna be more and more polarized as we continue to digest news in this sort of social media platform way? I think unless something big changes or maybe the way the algorithm are run changes, I do, I mean, it's hard to predict the future, but mm -hmm. I think the trends will probably just continue. Mm -hmm. I think you're exactly right. And how much responsibility is there for these platforms? I mean, you know, Facebook, now Meta, or Twitter, or Snapchat, or whatever these sort of, you know, content platforms uh, all around the world now, how much responsibility do they have to try and at least instill some objectivity, do some policing themselves? And I guess you start to tend towards like how much, how far do you take the freedom of speech? I think, I mean, that's a very complicated question. I think it sort of has a couple of assets to, uh, aspects to it. So first of all, I think an important question is, should this even be private, like privately held, right? Because as you said, I mean, information matters, we know information, information matters for political, mar uh, for politics, for financial markets. And I think if we think about the industry as a whole, without thinking about Meta or um, Twitter, et cetera, separately, I personally do think it should stay in the private market. Mm -hmm. um, just because the uh, what's the other option for mm -hmm. it to be run by the government and there are definitely countries where that's happening and i don't think we necessarily agree with that in this country and so i think for, to me that answer is actually clear so i do think that should stay in the so private the benefits sector. do currently sort of outweigh the the negative exactly it's mm -hmm. not you're exactly right is that the ideal solution no but mm -hmm. it's probably the lesser evil then the question is okay so now that it, it would maybe agree that it should be in the private market 
we don't want it to be a monopoly, obviously. Right. Whether it is or it isn't, it's a little bit harder to tell. I think we have a better sense about how to think about monopolies in sort of product markets and prices. But we do have, we have Meta, we have Twitter, we have Snapchat, TikTok, whatever young people use nowadays. <laughs> um, whether it's enough competition, I don't know, and that's something I think should be on the government and regulators to think about. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, that, that's a different question versus whether it should be, you know, whether it should be in the private hands anyway, or because I think that's part of the conversation now. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of policing, I think that's where it gets more complicated. And I, you're exactly right where, like, that's where the question of free speech could come up. I think you can police in different ways. First of all, I think when people hear policing uh, information, they think about fact checking. That's, I think, actually is a slippery slope, which is surprising because you'll say, well, facts, right? Well that, well, that was actually one of the points I was making when previously we digested news from newspapers, is I think there always was a certain degree of fact-checking that happened, mm -hmm. but it's a very big step <clears throat> to go from some fact-checking has happened to the extent that these newspapers then need to apologize for anything they've said that's factually incorrect, to people being able to say literally whatever they want and then their followers giving them the confirmation that they need to just to keep saying that. So how do, you, how do we go about challenging that? I think my problem kind of with thinking about fact checking is that some th facts are definitely facts, like did the company announce a certain earning or did something yeah. happen? But the problem is I think we're realizing that more and more facts and opinions can sometimes um, sort of be a gray area. I had, a, I had a great quote recently. Someone said, the plural of anecdote is not data, which I thought was a great quote because it's like, you can keep telling the story as many times you want. It doesn't make it true. But in some respects, that's, you know, that is what some people believe. If they hear something enough, it becomes truth. They don't need to have it fact-checked anymore. For sure, but they also, do, they might think it's a fact. Um, and we now even know, with, you know, some history that we think might be fact. You know, history was written by the winners. So <laughs> I, I just worry that when we say we should police for facts on social media, that it's going to become a slippery slope mm -hmm. in, in policing for in, uh, opinions. And that impedes on freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. So I think Fact checking, well, it seems like on surface very obvious, we should definitely fact check. I think that can actually become a very slippery slope. Mm. I think what we could m check for, and that's like I, everything goes back to my research, is I think these promotions, and it's becoming not just in my research, but it's becoming an actual problem. I'm sure you've heard about, you know, Kim Kardashian promoting mm -hmm. and others promoting cryptocurrencies now. And that is, I mean, we actually have regulation for this, that you have to disclose anything you're promoting, whether it's on Twitter or wherever you are, um, if you get payment for that. You have to disclose it, and a lot of celebrities don't. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I think is much easier to catch, and it's much clear cut. It's not whether it's a fact or an opinion, it's mm -hmm. either you were paid for it or you weren't. Yeah. And these people, they have, you know, 300 million followers. Yeah. Like the amount of influence they're building now, it's completely unprecedented. No financial advisor has 300 million followers no. that they can reach. <laughs> I doubt they even have 3 million followers. Do you think, you know, someone like the, like the Kardashians of this world who have so many followers, do you think they, that influence should somehow be curbed? Or if you reach a certain number of followers, I mean, the power that you have is, is so great. There needs to be some kind of policing or regulation of that because otherwise... Um, because I'm sure there's people out there that think, well, if it's good enough for Kim Kardashian, it's good <laughs> enough for me. Apparently about 20% of people who heard her ad bought Ethereum Max, which is what she was. So her wow. conversion rate is, again, much better than a politician or yeah. anybody else I know. Again, I think it's always a slippery slope, and I err on the side of um, freedom of speech, but it's my personal opinion. Again, if she's being paid to, pr to say something, she definitely has to disclose mm -hmm. it. I think the <clears> theory she even did, there was somewhere like, hashtag ad oh, right. but but I think it needs to be more clear um, mm -hmm. and I think in Europe I've actually seen it done um, in a funny way it's almost like when you have the um, cigarette packages where they show all the, you know, the lungs and dead people there was an ad I, was, I just came from Europe and there was an ad for eToro which is kind of like Robin Hood type company mm -hmm. and there was a guy you know saying oh well like, I made so much money and then bold red, it was displayed below that, 68% of investors that invest with the Toro lose money. 
Wow. So like, I, I would love to see something more of that yeah. in the US. So when Kim Kardashian yeah. um, talks about Ethereum Max, maybe there should be disclosure. Well, this brings me on to a topic I, I wanted to talk to you about, which is really sort of this idea of herd mentality. Um, I mean, it's, uh, I guess we're getting to sort of uh, economic theory here, but when something has enough credibility, it sort of by definition becomes adopted. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that there are certain cryptocurrencies which won't exist in the future. I'm sure many, many will. But there are some certain coins, uh, I won't use their full term, <laughs> uh, which really do seem to gain momentum by adoption by simply by herd mentality. And going on to some of these forums, um, again, I won't mention any names, but there's a lot of like forums out there. Now, if you, we used to have this thing in finance where <clears throat> it was illegal to do something called pump and dump, mm -hmm. which was basically, I couldn't hold a stock, then tell all my friends how great it is to get the price up and then sell it. But how is that different to you basically falling in love with some asset, it doesn't have to be a, a cryptocurrency, and then basically sort of sending out you know, uh, social media posts saying how great it is to try and get the, to try and get the price up and then, and then you selling it, is, is that not the same? Um, so actually, there, there is, in theory, an easy solution to that. Legally, you actually have to disclose. So you can, you're very welcome to promote a stock you hold. So mm -hmm. I've worked with um, Seeking Alpha and other uh, mm -hmm. social media platforms, and they do have rules. Like, you very much, there's nothing wrong with you buying Apple and telling other people how great it is as long as you disclose that you own Apple. Well, because see. then you can, you know, then it's up to me to decide whether you have conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. I think the problem comes up is when you do that, but you don't disclose that you have this particular stock or crypto, whatever it is, and then people are trusting you like, oh, you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart <laughs> right. without having some ulterior, ulterior, ulterior motives. Perhaps you can talk a little about the, you know, the democratization of uh, finance is a trend we've been seeing for a few years. And um, you know what happened with GameStop was uh, labeled by the media as somewhat the retail investor versus the hedge fund managers. Is that something you feel is a, a healthy thing that um, you know retail investors now have more power and these social media platforms help them have get that power? That's a tricky question. I think, and I think regulators are still sort of also uncertain about how to think about that. Um, partially because on once uh, on one hand we do want retail investors to participate more in financial markets, mm -hmm. partially because at least historically um, the stock market has been going up. You know, whether it will <laughs> past performance doesn't predict future performance. <laughs> Good to get that uh, clarification in. But, um, but we uh, do it, we feel like a lot of retail investors who haven't been participating have been missing out and that's been contributing to inequality, etc. So from that side we do want maybe more retail investors to participate in financial markets. On the other hand, we also have seen, I mean, they are by, most of them are what we call maybe less sophisticated or they haven't studied finance. And so they are much more easily influenced by social mm -hmm. media, by fraudulent or promotional information. And so it's a tricky question. Again, on the, I don't know that I have the perfect solution. I don't think it's great to kind of start a class warfare in finance that I mm -hmm. have a strong opinion about, but whether we, let or allow more retail investors to participate in what in what fashion maybe we only let them buy ETFs or mm -hmm. you know on the one hand we want them to have freedom to do whatever they want but on the other hand I do think there's so many behavioral biases yeah. that just prevent them from making sort of optimal decisions. Can I ask you about the Elon Musk Twitter deal? <laughs> Um, so I personally, I think uh, it depends what my opinion about that. So on the one hand, if he does what he says he's going to do, mm -hmm. I actually think that's a good thing. Um, so what, what do you mean by that? Because let's be clear what, what you think he Yeah, exactly. Well, let me tell you what I think he's going to do. <laughs> um, so first of all, what I've heard is that he will, kind of going back to what you mentioned earlier, algorithm. Mm -hmm. that he will make them public. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very good idea. Um, I assume it's not just me that when I'm on Instagram or Facebook, you just have a weird feeling that you're being manipulated. I, um, I'm not sure it's just a feeling. I no, think it's, it's just fact. Right, it's definitely a fact, and, but you don't exactly know how. Yeah, yeah. And oh, you're that's like, right, I see. Yeah, it's like, what are they showing me? Like, why am I seeing this post? Why, am not, my, like, why is somebody else not seeing this <laughs> post? And so I think to have a lot more transparency for us as consumers, but also for regulators and understand what's going on there is very important. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I think other companies could do the same like Facebook. 
Um, the second thing he, I heard he wants to do is to not ban people as easily. And I think, again, thinking about freedom of speech, we have certain rules, so you should, you should not be allowed to incite violence. And obviously people who do that, especially repeatedly, should be, in my opinion, banned from these platforms. Mm -hmm. Anything more than that, um, I think, again, banning but opinions. But what about just blatantly spreading false facts, though? I think that's tricky because um, I think that's where freedom of speech comes in. Okay. Because, again, sometimes when people say, um, and I, it, it's, I, really this is not related to politics, but I do think when people sometimes say this is a false fact, they just don't agree with a certain opinion. Right, so that, that, that's, that's an interesting point, is there's too many people right now who are disagreeing with an opinion and, and calling it a fake news when really it's it's subjective. Exactly, and I think it's just so short-sighted right. because right now maybe you're in power and maybe you are allowed to ban somebody, mm. but you're setting a very dangerous precedent, right? Because the next time you, it's not your opinion or the person in power doesn't have your opinion, they're going to ban people yeah. that agree with you, and I don't think we want to go down that road. It's sort of worrying in a, in a, in, in one way um, when I was when I was looking at finance, one of the most important things to do when you were looking at an idea was to read research that was the opposing opinion. And that's why you knew what the other, you know, if you, had, if you thought the stock was fantastic, you want to read research which says the opposite. And the trouble is we're not, people aren't having their ideas challenged at, at right now. So how do we try and, you know, to try and get people to have their ideas challenged um, wh where, where they digest their news? I think that's tricky. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> I think it's very honorable that you try to read other, you know, opinions <laughs> that are opposed uh, are opposed to you. I think you're very unique in that way. I think it's not just about. You might say, well, why don't we just show people both opinions? People, ha I mean, we have freedom of press more or less in this country, so you're well. Everybody's very welcome. It's not that hard to find opinions that are opposed to you. Mm. You can look at a TV channel <laughs> that mm -hmm. maybe you know is leaning a different way. But people don't want to do that. It doesn't feel good. Like we, we know psychologically, it really like in the brain, it hurts you mm. <laughs> to hear opinions that to think that you might be wrong. And so unless people are forced to do that, I, there's no way people kind of seek that out on their own. We've changed so much in the way we digest our news for the last five to 10 years. If you look out over the next few years, do you think it's just going to be more of the same, more of us being on our, our, our phones and tablets digesting news? Or do you think there's new you know, ideas or regulations that may come in? Most likely it's going to be more of the same. Um, we will see again with Elon Musk. Oh, I realized I didn't <laughs> tell you the other side of that. Um, my worry with that um, and more broadly is that he might not actually do what he says he's doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if he does what he says he's doing, that might actually change the way some of these platforms are run, mm -hmm. um, just because some other platforms might have to follow suit just due to competition. Mm -hmm. So honestly, that's probably the biggest kind of shot at changing things there. Otherwise, I think there's so many, I mean, while I love kind of this question of social media, there are obviously, you know, we have the war in Ukraine right now and so many other issues that I don't think this is this is a sort of regulator's priority right now, or as right. much maybe as it should be. So I think status quo, or like more of the same, is probably where we're going to go in the next couple of years. Got it. Well, listen, thank you very much for your time. It was so interesting chatting with you, and uh, thanks again. Thank you very much for having me.